OK, let's compare answers. Is the imagery in the first poem successful? Let's look at this. It's a very short poem. In a station of the metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd pedals on a wet black bow. The title is also part of the poem. It tells us where we are. Apparition, as one group member mentioned, means ghost. A ghostly appearance of faces in the crowd. And then line two, flowers on a wet tree branch. And these two lines are connected by a semicolon, when hall. So the poem seems to imply that these two are somehow related. There's some kind of connection between these two images. Uh, and the title tells us that the first line is the reality and the second line is the image. So I talked to a few groups about th this question. Does this comparison work? Some people think no. There's nothing similar between these two images. They have no idea why the poem puts them together. But others thought hmm, there is something similar because in a metro, and it says it's a wet tree branch, so maybe outside is raining, so in the station everybody is wet. Maybe it's a dark day, everybody is wearing dark colors. And this is 1913, 1916, so of course the poem is only about white people. Uh, so you then have the image of little dots of white against a background of wet black. Kind of like flowers on a wet black bow. Uh, another when uh, personally, when I read this poem, the image I get is of uh, a scene in a movie. So like in the background, you have an over like a high shot of a station, a metro station filled with people. They're dressed in like dark suits and hats and like women in dark dresses and coats. And they're there. It's crowded. Everybody's walking around. This is the background. And then suddenly the focus shifts to the foreground. And in the foreground, you have the second image. Um, a, bl a black wet tree branch with cherry blossoms on it. And for some reason, the colors and the feeling of these two images to me fit together very well. Even though, of course, if you think about it, if you can see inside the metro station, you probably don't have cherry blossoms. Um, but the point of this poem is to make you think about the question. The point is not the answer. Some people think it makes sense. Some people think it does not make sense. But the point is, can you try to make it make sense? The poet is asking you to try to find something similar. Uh, in fact, Ezra Pound, the poet, liked to start literary movements, Some of them were very successful. Some of them were not very successful. This poem was his example of something he called imagism, uh, or something like that. And the idea is to only give images and not explain, to let images be the language of poetry. And apparently a lot of people agreed with him because this was very popular. Um, and he took inspiration from the haiku, paiju, which is usually so short that you don't have space to explain. Um, yeah, so at this time, this was something new. No explanation, no context, just images. Um, today, of course, we see this all the time. If you watch a movie in the middle, you might have a montage sequence, montaichi. All images, some music, no sense. Question two, the river merchant's wife. Do you think that it matters that Pound did not know the original language? Well, uh, a couple of people took this question. One person said, it does matter because it is so different from the original. For example, 
the English version does not rhyme. The English version does not use a regular meter. And uh, this classmate of yours also mentioned that Chinese characters, especially ancient Chinese characters, sorry, classical Chinese characters often have many different meanings. But the English version is very straightforward. Each line only has basically one meaning. So um, because of this difference and because according to this classmate, there's nothing really special about the English version, uh, he would say that this is not in fact a poem, not even in English. He thinks this is more like notes on the original poem. And I can see why uh, people might think this. It is true. It's very straightforward. Uh, it's just telling a story with with some details. That's it. But another group thought that it does not matter that the poet did not know the original language because the English version itself is a pretty good poem. And so if we look at this as its own original poem, then you start to notice. First of all, things like the the details that are chosen the specific images, right? Not just a gate, but a front gate. Not just stilts, but bamboo stilts. Not just flowers, but blue plums, etc. Like there are specific details that make it more literary. Um, but we also have to notice that a lot of these details don't just add imagery. They also add an exotic flavor, equal feng qing. Bamboo is not something that they were familiar with in uh, Europe and North America. Putting hair straight across the forehead is not a common or was not a common Western hairstyle. They would not call their husbands my lord, etc. So another um, attraction of this poem is that it feels exotic. It, we might even say that it feels oriental. Um, so in fact, it actually does matter that the poet did not know the original language, but it matters it for the opposite reason. If he knew Chinese or Japanese, he might have been able to avoid these simple exoticisms, simple orientalist uses of language. But instead, because he doesn't know the language, it's like he's hearing this story from somebody else. These are his impressions of the poem. He's not able to say this word matches that word, this meaning matches that meaning. He can only say this situation feels like this situation. Uh, and so it's kind of like how ChatGPT can't write you a good essay. It can only write you something that looks like a good essay. There's always that gap, that distance, and it's because he didn't know the language. At the same time, if you did not know that this is based on something else, if this were an original poem in English, uh, then you might think, wow, it's actually not bad. The author has a great imagination for Eastern culture that he does not understand, and he can tell a very interesting story using interesting imagery. So again, the answer to the question is uh, more than one answer. You can look at this poem from both sides. Personally, I actually really like reading Chinese poetry in English. Um, like one classmate mentioned that there's no rhyme, there's no meter, but I actually think that not having a rhyme, not having a regular meter adds to the effect. To me, it makes it more interesting if there's something surprising. I cannot expect what will happen next. Uh, and of course, looking at traditional Chinese imagery through a different language also makes it seem kind of different. But that's just my personal feeling. Um, but again, with 
a poem by Ezra Pound, we have different ways of looking at what it is and does it make sense? Let's take a short break and when we come back, we'll talk about question three.
Question three. Ah, yes, the question related to Marianne Moore's poetry. OK, so let's take a look at this poem. When I was choosing the, the selections for this week, I was a bit worried about choosing this poem because it's not exactly easy to understand. In fact, if you take all of these words and you just put them in order, it completes a very short essay. It uses perfect grammar, it uses logical argument, and yet it is a poem. And we'll talk about this situation in question five. For now, let's take a look at line eight. When, okay, so first of all, let me remind you, this fiddle, this is the end of line one. It is not line two. In poetry, when a line gets too long, it, you have to break it into two lines, and the second line gets indented to tell you that it is in fact still part of the previous line. So line five is this one that can dilate. So you have one, two, three, four, five. OK, so line eight. When they become so derivative as to become unintelligible. The same thing may be said for all of us that we do not admire what we cannot understand. So what is this they? Uh, they are useful. These things are important. What are these things? Hands that can grasp, eyes that can dilate, hair that can rise if it must. So hands, eyes, hair, physical, concrete body images. How do these things become derivative? Well, one group took this question and they pointed out that after the colon here, what we cannot understand, the poem gives us some examples. The bat holding on upside down or in quest of something to eat. So this is kind of like the hand that can grasp, right? Here the bat is holding on upside down. It's not the same, but it's similar. If we think of the human as the original image, then the bat is a derivative image. It also is holding on to something. What else do we have? Elephants pushing, a wild horse taking a roll, a tireless wolf under a tree. The immovable critic twitching his skin like a horse that feels a flea. OK, so you here you have to know that twitch is not just a body motion. It's a body motion that expresses something uncomfortable. In this case, the subject is the critic. So maybe the critic has some opinions about the art. Right, so something that the critic wants to say, something that's troubling him. And that's why he's twitching. Like a horse that feels a flea. The baseball fan, the statistician. OK, why do we suddenly have a statistician in here? Well, if you think about baseball fans, the thing that they often most care about are the statistics. How many home runs did this player hit? How many uh, strikes did this pitcher pitch? Right, baseball fans really care about the numbers. So in fact, you can say that the statistician is derivative of the baseball fan. The baseball fan is the original image and the statistician is a derivative image. So going back to the question, when these original images become more and more derivative, do they become 
unintelligible, do they become harder to understand? Could be, right? We just looked at how uh, I had to explain the idea of the critic twitching his skin like a horse that feels a flea. I had to explain the statistician and the relationship between statistics and baseball. The further you get from the original thing, the harder it is to understand. That could make sense. On the other hand, the first example, uh, moving from a human hand to a bat holding on upside down, that's not too hard to understand. Uh, you can see the similarity between these two quite easily. So another way to understand this sentence, when they become so derivative as to become unintelligible. Another way to understand this is to think of derivative as meaning abstract. So in this case, we would be talking about language. Let's look at the language of this poem. It starts with concrete images, right? Hands, eyes, hair. And then we slowly get more abstract interpretation, derivative, unintelligible. And then near the bottom, phenomena, prominence, triviality, insolence, all of these really abstract, hard to understand words. And the more abstract the language is, it's true, the harder it is to understand the poem. Excuse me. And so the poem itself is an example of this sentence. The more derivative, the more unintelligible. By reading the poem, you feel the meaning of this line. Like when it mentions hands and hair, when it mentions bats and elephants, it's not hard to understand, but when it talks about derivative, unintelligible, phenomena, insolent, then it becomes harder to understand, exactly as it says. And in fact, that is the whole argument of this poem. Okay, now I'm getting into question five. Well, let's save that for later. Question four. In in just why is the balloon man queer and why is he goat footed? This one, very cute poem. Or so it seems. Um, OK, so in just spring when the world is mud luscious, the little lame balloon man whistles far and wee. So the first thing, the balloon man is lame. Trejal. And Eddie and Bill come running from marbles and piracy. So they were originally playing with marbles, playing at being pirates, and they come running. And it's spring when the world is puddle wonderful. The queer old balloon man whistles far and wee. And Betty and Isabel come dancing from hopscotch and jump rope. Hopscotch is when you draw squares on the floor and you jump through the squares. Tell goods. And it's spring and the goat footed balloon man whistles far and we. So why goat footed? Why queer? OK, so one group mentioned that. Uh, Goat footed kind of makes them think of the Greek god of nature, Pan, Panon, who is also usually in the form of a goat man. And so because he looks like a goat, he would also seem very queer, which at the time just meant strange. Could be. And in this case, that would also connect with the idea of spring. Spring is pan season when things start to grow. Uh, and everybody likes to celebrate the rebirth of nature. And so this cute little poem about uh, children running to buy a balloon then becomes a celebration of spring 
and even the Greek gods are participating in the joyous occasion. Very cute. But there's another possible explanation. If you look up goat footed online, you might find that having clawed feet or like goated feet is a traditional symbol of the devil. And that could also explain why the balloon man seems strange. Maybe he's not here to sell balloons. Maybe he's here to use balloons to attract children. And that can also help explain why near the end of the poem it says balloon man and the M is a capital M because it's not just an ordinary man, it's a very powerful, very strange, very scary kind of man, like a devil. Then you also have the fact that he's lame. This is quite unfair, but in literature, often people with a disability are seen as less perfect, less moral. Think about the movies you've seen. The villains will often have like a scar, like a cut. Maybe they have a cane. Maybe they have some kind of something wrong with their face. Traditionally, these kinds of uh, physical imperfections have been used to symbolize personal and moral imperfections. So in this case, the fact that the balloon man is lame also tells us that something is not quite right with him. So if in fact this poem is about the devil using balloons to lure little young children during the happy days of spring, then it actually becomes very ironic, right? It turns from a very positive poem into a very cynical poem. Like uh, I recently read something on Twitter. A guy said um, he was telling his, uh, he his neighbor was telling him that uh, the cats that he picked up from the shelter kept getting taken by coyotes, Tai Long. This was in LA. Uh, and every time he lost a cat, he would go to the shelter to get another cat. And he could never keep these cats. They always got taken and eaten by coyotes. And the author said, well, it sounds like you're just getting new cats to feed the coyote. Right? It's a different way of looking at it. Um, and so perhaps the balloon man is not sharing the springtime joy. He's using the appearance of spring and of joy in order to better lure these innocent children. Maybe. OK, question five, why the experimentation? So we talked about how in Moore's poetry, the lines are either very long or very short, and also the use of language is sometimes very abstract. And so uh, one possible reason is, as I mentioned earlier, she's trying to make us feel her point, not just understand it, but as we find it harder and harder to read, we also uh, begin to understand what she's trying to say. Another way to say this is that as it becomes harder and harder to read, we have to work harder and harder to understand what she's saying. And when we finally understand what she's saying, it turns out she's saying that the more abstract language you use, the harder it is to read. So at the end point, the meaning that we discover echoes the experience we had of reading the poem. In fact, that is exactly what the poem is about. Let's uh, look at this. Um, so up to this, the statistician, up to here it's saying that the more derivative or abstract language is harder to understand. But then she says nor. So to reverse position, 
on the other hand, nor is it valid to discriminate against business documents and school books. All these phenomena are important. So at the same time, you can't say that poetry is more important than these other kinds of writing. All of them are important. One must make a distinction, however. There's still a difference. When dragged into prominence by half poets, the result is not poetry. So even if somebody writes something and says, look, it's poetry. If this person is not a poet, if they don't have that imagination, if they don't know how to actually create a meaningful poem, then the result is not poetry. Nor till the poets among us can be literalists of the imagination above insolence and triviality and can present for inspection imaginary gardens with real toads in them, shall we have it? It is referring to poetry. So when will we have real poetry? When our so-called poets become literalists of the imagination and can give us imaginary gardens with real toads in them. In other words, when they can give us this real concrete imagery, not derivative, not abstract, real and concrete. In the meantime, if you demand on the one hand the raw material of poetry in all its rawness. So if you can't wait for a poet to take these materials and turn them into poetry with concrete imagery, if instead you want those materials themselves, and you also want, on the other hand, that which is genuine, which is real, then in fact you are interested in poetry. So the whole idea of this essay poem, if you will, is that only concrete real imagery, original imagery, should be called poetry. And after you understand that this is the main point, you will realize, wait, this poem doesn't have truly concrete real imagery. It's an essay, it's an abstract idea. Last week we looked at uh, when William Carlos Williams wrote, no ideas but in the things themselves. And when he said this, he said it in a poem with concrete imagery. Here, Marianne Moore is saying the same thing, but she's using a poem where the imagery is not the central important aspect. It's simply helping her to talk about an abstract idea. And maybe that's why she begins the poem by saying, I too dislike it. I also dislike poetry. There are things that are important beyond all this fiddle. Fiddle just means nonsense. So as she says later, right, business documents and school books are also very important. So I dislike poetry. There are more important things. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it. One discovers in it, after all, a place for the genuine. So if you read poetry without any interest, if you read it for no reason at all, then maybe you will discover something real inside it. And therefore, the rest of the poem is explaining what is real in the poem and how can we find it? So why does she write in this way? Because she doesn't just want to tell us something, she wants to make us feel it as we read, as we put these ideas together in our head. What about Cummings? Well, the first poem, um, we talked about some of the ideas, right? We talked about uh, why the balloon man has a capital M the second time. Um, but like, look at how the poem is written on the page. In just spring, why is the just capital J? 
it's emphasizing that spring has only just begun. It's the very, very beginning of spring. And then mud luscious. This is very interesting because like when you see the end of line two, we know that this is not the full word. But we also know there's no there's no common word that begins with mud. And it turns out it's not a common word. It's a created word. Mud luscious means full and of luxurious mud, very muddy and it's a good thing. So even here, the poet is playing with our expectations. Uh, and then balloon man is one word. Whistles far and we spread out on the page makes you see the distance. And in fact, maybe you can hear the whistling wafting away into the distance. Eddie and Bill, two people considered as one pair. Uh, not separate. Comes running from marbles and piracies and it's spring. One word in that line emphasizes the idea of spring. It's like a surprise. Uh, and then. Near the end of the poem, suddenly everything becomes very vertical and crazy. It's spring and the goat footed balloon man whistles far and we. Now. I don't know about you, but this to me looks like somebody whistling. Like if you think of a comic, like a manhua, and somebody is whistling, it will maybe go in this direction, the, the sound on the page. Right? It makes us the distance between the words, the length of the of these lines uh, vertically kind of imitates the sound of whistling traveling far away. And right in the middle of this image is the word goat footed, the key to understanding this poem. Uh, at the central point, it is like a pivot or like a hinge. It's like a you have two different interpretations revolving around the same image. Um, this kind of style. OK, I'm, I'm sorry, this will be a little bit confusing, but this kind of style of poetry where the space and the arrangement also matters, this is called concrete poetry. It's a specific style. So for concrete poetry, it's almost impossible to read and get all of the meaning. You have to look at how it's arranged on the page. You know, I recently won an award for concrete poetry. I wrote a poem that looks like snow and somebody gave me an award. Uh, and then the second poem by Cummings, pity this busy monster, man unkind. So first of all, mankind just means humans, but here he says man unkind. And in fact, the second line belies the title. It's the title seems to say have pity on Korean Korean, but the second line says not don't pity. Progress is a comfortable disease. Your victim death and life safely beyond. Plays with the bigness of his littleness. <laughs> so victim here means the person suffering from the disease of progress. And it's saying that when we consider progress, death and life are not at issue. We're not talking about life and death things. We're talking about something theoretical, academic, even maybe trivial. Your victim plays with the bigness of his littleness. He turns something very small into something very big. He spends a lot of time and energy on something small. Electrons deify one razor blade into a mountain range. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, electron microscopic imagery. They turn one razor blade into a mountain range. 
deify means turn into a god. So here the poem is also implying that uh, we worship this kind of science. Lenses. Extend unwish through curving where when till unwish returns on its unself. So of course we of course see the repeated use of un, un as a kind of negation for drift for thing. So it's implying that the thing that it's talking about is not real. It doesn't matter. It's not that serious. Wish through curving where when where is uh, space when is time. So curving where when actually means the bending of space time. So it's saying like, yes, we have these powerful telescopes. We can see so far into space that we can tell that space time is curving and bending. But at the end of this observation, what do we get? It when it comes back to us, when it returns on itself, what do we get? And it seems to be saying we don't really get anything. It's not a wish. It's an unwish. We don't see ourselves. We see an unself. A world of made is not a world of born. The world that we see through the science that we have made is not the same as the natural world. We have created this scientific world that we are observing. It's not something we would know in nature in daily life. So instead of pitying humans, it says pity poor flesh, Rosen, and trees, poor stars and stones. So like the actual concrete natural images, these actual things of nature that we can see in daily life. We're ignoring all of them to chase this new science. So pity, trees, stars, stones, but never this fine specimen of hyper magical ultra omnipotence. It's talking about humans super magical we can do uh, there's a famous quote by the science fiction author arthur c clark he said any sufficiently advanced science sorry any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic so hyper magical humans ultra omnipotence potency means power Omni, OK, let me use the, the mouse. Potency means power. Omni means all. So omnipotence means all powerful. But this isn't enough. He has to add an ultra. So it's super all powerful. Uh, he's mocking humans belief in scientific progress. We doctors know a hopeless case if break. It, it does not end the sentence. The sentence says the original sentence is we know a hopeless case if we see one. Uh, in Chinese, I guess we would say But because it's a hopeless case, it doesn't matter how much he says, right? Because he won't change anybody's mind. So he decides to stop instead of finishing the sentence. Listen, there's a hell of a good universe next door. Let's go. So at, by the end of the poem, he has given up on this world and he's saying, let's try the world next door. Um, but this second to last line is also very interesting. Most of the poem, he's saying science is not worth it. And so when he says there's a hell, we expect him to continue saying how these uh, advances in science will bring terrible consequences. Like something like there's a hell to be made of science or there's a hell for scientists who ignore daily life or something. But instead, he's just using the 
a normal phrase, a hell of a good something, which means a very good something. So it's also like subverting our expectations. And then one last thing I think is very important to notice. Why is the poet so against progress? Why exactly is progress such a bad thing? Well, look at the date. The poem was published in 1944. What was happening in science around that time? Something related to the war? New technology to kill people more efficiently? The nuclear bomb? Like, did you guys see Oppenheimer? Oppenheimer. Right, that's a movie about how great advances in science are used to develop a weapon that could kill hundreds and thousands of people. As at the time during the war, people just wanted to win the war. But after the war ended, people were thinking, wait, maybe we shouldn't have done that. Maybe this technology was not meant to be created. And that's kind of the situation that this poem is talking about. So yes, inside the poem, it's saying when you pursue these magical scientific advances, you ignore the nature in daily life around you. But the reason the poet was writing this maybe also had to do with the war. So why is this experimental? Um, mostly, the, the most experimental part of this poem is how it uses the prefix un, right? Unkind. And then you have, uh, where was it? Uh, unwish, unself. So instead of saying something and then saying that this is the wrong idea, he puts the negation inside the sentence. So every time we read that un, we know that he's against this idea. He doesn't have to spend more words to explain how he's against it. And then because he doesn't respect the boundaries of regular words, he can create words like hypermagical, ultra omnipotence, which are not real words, but by making them these long and silly words, we understand that he's mocking those who support scientific progress. Uh, and then, of course, we have the word where, when. I, I love this word. It's, it's so, so great. It means space time, but because space time is a word that has been taken by scientists, when the poet wants to say something similar, he wants his own language. If he said space time, then his language would be agreeing with the language of scientists. But he's against those scientists, so he had to come up with his own language. And I think this is a very good solution. Where, when, place and time. So he's experimental in this poem to better and more efficiently and more purely convey his ideas. Language here is not just about clarity, it's also about um, perspective and political position. The language that he uses is in line with the political position that he's trying to say. And question six, choose a poem. How can you tell into war? So let's look at the characteristics of the interwar era. What do we have? Uh, OK, so we have lots of people in Paris, right? Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, Ernest Hemingway, we're all in Paris. And so that's why Ezra Pound's poem in a station of the metro is also set in Paris. He was also there. 
we have again going back to modernism. When Pound and Moore are looking at individual images and not giving us the context, we can think of that as kind of seeking a tradition. There's nothing to tie them together. It's asking you, the reader, to do the work of tying them together. Uh, when Pound tries to translate a poem from the East, he's also seeking tradition, a different tradition. If we no longer have a tradition in the West, maybe he can find a new tradition in the East. Uh, and then E. e. Cummings, uh, pity this. What was the name of the poem? Pity this busy monster, man unkind, is a political poem. Uh, and the way that it's written, its experiments, its vocabulary is an example of aesthetic politics, using art for a political purpose. Uh, and if we think about unjust, about how the balloon man could be a symbol of spring or a symbol of evil, both at the same time. That's kind of psychoanalytical. Right? People are super egos and ids. Combined in the same person, just like in this poem, the symbol of spring and the symbol of evil are combined in the same poem. And of course, like if you want to talk about the nuclear bomb, then uh, this also includes uh, the US entering World War II. So are, these are some signs uh, that these poems were written in the 20th century, early 20th century, the interwar era. Yeah, OK, so do you have questions about these six? OK, so I have some bad news for you. The difficult readings will continue next week. Next week, we're going to read Barn Burning by William Faulkner, the guy who wrote The Sound and the Fury. It's a short story. I do think it's it's short. It's not too long. But the the difficult part of this story is that it takes place in the American South and they speak English a little different there. So for example, here, Aorn, what is this word? It, it simply means ours, but as you can see from the next word, it's a hypercorrection based on mine. If the Possessive pronoun in the first person ends in N. Then according to this logic, the possessive pronoun of the first person plural should also end in N. In the third person singular should also end in N. This is called a hypercorrection. Right, so arn, mine, hisn, all are just um, possessive pronouns. Uh, and there are some other examples uh, uh, when characters talk later. For example, here, I aim to. I don't figure to stay in a country. Am sorry, I aim to. I don't figure to stay in a country among people who blah, blah, blah. Uh, and this simply means th that is what I'm going to do. I don't plan on staying in a place with people who. Right, so the way that they talk will be a little bit different from what you're expecting. Um, the story of barn burning is set in the rural American South Mississippi, let's say. Uh, it's told from the perspective of a young boy, right? The boy, second line, the boy. The boy belongs in 
a family that people often consider white trash, very low class white people. Uh, and usually this class of people survive by doing basic farm work. Um, but because most of the farms are owned by rich landowners, they have to work for other people. The, usually this would not be a problem, right? You, you go farm, you make some money, you feed your family. OK, the problem is the boy's father. Is a very proud and arrogant man. He fought in the Civil War. He feels like maybe he deserves better life. And so whenever his boss or the landowner tells him to do something, he gets really pissed. And uh, this is a problem because his whole job is to do what other people ask him to do. And so in this story, we get a, a couple of examples of how the boy's father expresses his anger. And the main way that he does this is that he goes to burn down the barn of the landowner. That's why the story is called barn burning. Uh, and of course, whenever he burns the barn, he gets taken to court. In this case, because it's a very rural area, so we don't have an actual court. It's simply somewhere that the uh, judge can bring people together. So the judge in this case is not even a full judge. He's simply called a justice of the peace. He's somebody who does a judge's job without actually being a judge. That's how rural this place is. So the one you haven't done that, you can't find a judge. Uh, and so every time he burns a barn, he gets caught, he gets run out of town, and the whole cycle starts over again. Uh, and so the story is about how this little boy comes to understand the problem with his family and how he decides to try to solve the problem. Okay, it's not too long, right? One page, two pages, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, thirteen pages, not too long. Uh, and I do have a piece, a small piece of good news, which is that barn burning is actually the subject of one of the example answers to the essay questions. So if you're having trouble understanding the story, you can read this example answer. Maybe it will help you. So that's next week. Uh, and then the week after that, I will be passing out a new handout and uh, we'll be introducing the last literary period, the late 20th century. OK, questions? Okay, so that's it for today. Have fun reading. See you next week.